I thought I would start this talk by a reading, actually. Um, when I first really started to think about Lynette's work um, very deeply, um, it was a couple of years ago, seeing some shows in New York. And then I was asked by Lynette to write a text for a catalog for a show at the Serpentine Gallery last year. Last year. And um, chose the opportunity to write this essay as a way to sort of think even more deeply about a particular group of paintings, one of which you see on the, on the wall here. So I'm going to write, I'm sorry, I'm going to read this text, and then we'll get into a sort of general discussion uh, based on some questions I've written down, but we'll veer off from those questions, I'm sure. Um, the essay is called On the Hour, On the Times. And uh, it's based on four paintings, and I'll say the name of the painting and then read the text that's associated with this painting, and then I'll go to the next image. So, uh, on the screen is An Afternoon on Wednesday, 2011 is the date. On the edge of his seat, or on the edge of a bed or bench, hands clasped and resting in his lap, he awaits someone just beyond our gaze, a man, I presume, but that's just me. He wears a black and white striped crew neck shirt and pants of an indeterminate cut, an outfit reminiscent of James Baldwin, who wore similar attire in a photo taken circa 1965 while he awaited the muses at his desk with a typewriter in a rented villa on the Bosphorus. And if striped shirts don't conjure an image of Baldwin, perhaps it reminds you of James Dean, or Gene Seberg, or Edie Sedgwick, or prisoners in early movies, sledgehammers swinging in unison at the edge of a country road. Or sailors, who if they have fallen overboard, are more easily spotted in stripes than in navy solids. This one is not overboard in that dark brown sea, but he is awaiting rescue. Eleven PM Friday, also from 2010. The figure in the striped top is warming up for tonight's performance, which, given the hour, is a late show. We are happy for him finally at center stage after being made to wait off to the side for so long, but he seems a bit tentative, as if now in the spotlight he is unsure what show he is supposed to be starring in. He has lost a little weight, more exercise, less sitting around. He has shed his trousers and donned skin-tight color. He has shapely calves. Sometimes he stands like his mother, one hand cradling his neck, one arm akimbo. And having met the artist, I feel this painting feels like a self-portrait, although I've never seen her in stripes. But to invent a figure, you have to start somewhere. So she must have started with herself, from there building a scaffold on which to hang things like blackness or masculinity, things that are fugitive and subject to revision. 11 p.m. Saturday, also from, oh, sorry, from 2011. What you looking at? Oh, sorry, I have to, <laughs> what you looking at? Um, <laughs> this painting, <laughs> what you looking at? <laughs> I couldn't imagine that a black figure staring straight ahead wouldn't be staring hard, but he ain't staring hard. In fact, he ain't hard at all but he ain't beat down or under siege or an endangered species either. No dignity, uplift, celebration, or positivity in this painting. No keeping it real or representing. He's just a black figure and that's that. Eleven PM Tuesday from 2010. Regrets, a dark brown taste, hand covering the mouth to prevent bile from spewing out. Or maybe that gesture is just something now remembered, 
some missed opportunity. Too late to start dwelling on the past. Go on, get on with it. He is up and dressed, as usual, in his striped top, although it's really more of the idea of a top, a little something to cover his nakedness. Indeed, he is the idea of a black man. He is life-sized and anatomically correct, yes, but when we stare at the whites of his painted eyes or at the skin-tight color of his thighs, what we see is an illustration accompanying many, many ideas about black men, bits and pieces of things, a mood board brought together at this late hour, 11 p.m., which although the day is nearly done, in fact, feels like the beginning of something new. So um, just for people who didn't get a chance to see the show, there's some general installation shots. And I want to start, I guess, with um, this image, um, uh, the title of which is Midnight Midweek, and it's one of these men in their stripy tops. And what was interesting to me was that when I was asked to write for the catalog, I didn't know that this was an ongoing series. I didn't know how many of these paintings there were. I was just really interested in the fact that because of this article of clothing, this top, which immediately gave me these associations with James Baldwin, I could start to construct this whole narrative around who these men were, even though they weren't the same men. And so this article of clothing allowed me, in a sense, to create this narrative. All of your work invites the viewer to create this narrative, but it was this article of clothing in particular uh, that sort of spurred these stories that I wrote. And so maybe you could talk about, you know, the importance of the stripy top men <laughs> in your practice, but also maybe more generally about the, the role of narrative for the viewer in, in looking at your work. Well, it's, he, um, it, it's hard to know where to begin with, with the striped topped men, because it, it began as an exercise that I would do at the beginning of every large body of work. Mm. And there were two people I felt I had to paint before I could do anything else, before I could sort of, almost as a, as a means of focusing my attention and reminding myself of why I'm doing any of it. Because there was something about the man in the striped top, and then there's another painting that I'll talk about later, that somehow encapsulated all the ideas um, to do with um, narrative, to do with painting, to do with a certain sense of humor, a certain ideology, a certain kind of emotion, a certain approach to gender, and a certain approach to men, so and, and women in a, another sense. Um, and so I think the initially it was a, a useful tool, because nothing not many of the paintings early on included much color mm. or used color, but there was something about placing this, this white and negotiating a white and red stripe or a white and blue stripe or a white and purple stripe that bound the figure together. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if the top is there to hold them together. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes like building bricks. And the idea of repetition, I think, came about, um, it was a painter, this painter called, um, how was his name? Yan Pei Ming, who I remember said that every day he would go into the studio and paint a small image of Chairman Mao, which was a way of him kind of grounding everything mm. that, that he wanted to do with the work. And it was almost like a, a warm up or a mm -hmm. reminder. So that he became a kind of, or these men became a form of a warm up and a reminder but also started to take on a more kind of mythical sense that they would always be titled with a, 
a time and a day. And no, it, initially, it was always the weekend. But then I ran out of weekend <laughs> night right, hours. Right. Um, so I had to branch out into the rest of the week. But with that, the, the, the attitude changed. Somehow, he shifted. It was always someone different each time, but the, the, the whole sense of being shifted. And I mm. thought about sailors. I thought about, I was very much reminded of Jean Genet, the Creel de, mm -hmm. de, de Brest, and um, this, I don't know, this form of narrative that was never quite linear, but somehow brought in all this kind of violence and beauty and a certain type of romance. Mm -hmm. Because um, the men, I feel each of these men somehow, it, it was, they didn't always work. I should, I should say that there were a lot that failed and I think the reason why they failed was something about them wasn't quite right. There's something very particular to all of these that is to do with a certain attitude and a certain, certain presence and the right kind of allure, right. somehow. So when you're thinking about this, you know, these men as a group, mm. you, and I should say, you're not creating, you know, they're not based on particular people, they're always mm -hmm. amalgamations Composite. of images mm. and ideas and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, well, a couple of things are interesting. Um, one is when you switch the titles to sort of midweek titles, mm. I think I heard you say that you had to switch the men in some ways, that the, the, the title itself, yeah. where they're situated yeah. in the week, had to change kind of the yeah. approach to what you were painting, which yeah. is kind of amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Hence, it didn't always work. But the, yeah, because I think there was something about encapsulating an aspect of the night at the weekend. Mm -hmm. I've always had a certain, I don't know, there was something about the, the days or the nights from Thursday to Saturday that for me were filled with a kind of menace. Not, and that's not to say that the figures... Because you live in London. Were and that's because I live in London. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something to do with living in a country where people drink from, from Thursday. No, um, but <laughs> Thursday <laughs> to Sunday morning. <laughs> to Sunday morning without stopping and you can't go outside. Um, but no, it, I think it wasn't that the menace was... It wasn't even about menace so much. It was about... It was menace and romance and, mm. and violence and... Ex excitement, a certain type of excitement, a certain type of, and that's what I meant by allure. A lot of those, um, a lot of the ones that are at the weekend, I was really thinking about the look in their eye mm. being mm. a very particular kind of sexy, a very particular kind of, um, I, oh, it's, it's so, it's very subtle and it's very, it's very difficult to describe and to capture, but that was, initially, that was really the idea of the weekend. And then the midweek ones were often looking away or hmm. not particularly mm -hmm. engaging in the same way or they're kind of, you know, their gestures changed. Um, but yeah, the, 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 it's interesting how the, for me, what was really interesting was how the more I painted the striped top, the more it became like a kind of armor or a, or a, set, a, a, a means of holding the, the head in place with the arms, in place with the legs. Um, and the idea of them not really wearing anything specific, you know, they're, they're, they're always in tights. Tights that are kind of inky black, but also could be bare legs, but um, are always just very simply described and never any shoes. That it was really, they're, they're kind of just they, they're so composited, they're so held together right. by, the, by the top. I remember when I was, um, the essay was being copy edited, I wrote uh, skin tight color, and the editor wrote, you mean skin colored tights? <laughs> oh God help us. And I thought, <laughs> well, <laughs> does his face look like his tights? Well, there you go. <laughs> well, it was <'cause> bizarre. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Right, but totally <laughs> fascinating. I mean, yeah. the, that 
yeah. that the color of the yeah. of the tights would somehow be skin. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, they're quite clearly not his skin. Right. Um, <laughs> but it was, it, I think, in initially, probably in the handling of them, because I always have this problem when I start one of, one of the paintings on the very, very, these kind of very dark backgrounds is, is how to graduate the darkness so that it doesn't, they, they don't just, like, the, the legs don't disappear or that the, mm. the background doesn't become too pale too soon or too dark too soon that you get the right gradation of color and of, of darkness, basically. So often when it, when it fails, the, you, you, the, the legs aren't quite dark enough mm. and I can't do anything about mm -hmm. changing that. It just gets really trapped. Mm -hmm. So, so there, there were instances where they become more flesh-colored, but for the, the intention is that they are sort of black, tights right. they are completely a solid mm. black and and that they become almost like stilts they become kind of very stiff almost not leg like mm -hmm. at all yeah i think um we're gonna i think talk more about some formal issues too i wanted mm -hmm. to show this painting because or this group of paintings because i was really interested uh, we we met yesterday and walked through the show and i was really interested in the installation itself and how you think through what needs to be what next to what. Mm -hmm. So there is this painting, um, uh, what's it called? The woman looking. Um, I've got it written down here somewhere. Is it the woman that watches? I can't remember. I've got so many. Yeah. This yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the woman with the binoculars, and what she is, so that painting, mm -hmm. <laughs> and what she's looking at across the room is this. <laughs> but we were talking about that, and you said that in the installation, that wasn't the painting that was initially there. There was another mm -hmm. painting there, mm -hmm. but you needed a painting that could hold up to her gaze. And it's such an interesting thing to think of not only groups of figures, like the stripy top man, but to think of the installation and making groups mm -hmm. for the viewer in the installation and forcing a kind of, you know, gazes between paintings, but also gazes out of paintings. So half the paintings in the, in the show are looking at us and half the paintings are looking across at other paintings. So maybe you could talk a little about, you know, sort of about mm. installation and that kind of strategy and because yeah. it's a risky thing to do, yeah. you know, in some ways. Instead of like making an installation that's like, okay, you look at this painting, you mm. look at this painting, they're all separated out. Mm. You really insisted on this, mm. you know, the gazes between these yeah. figures. Yeah, I mean, I think half the problem is that my studio is really small. <laughs> and I, so I often have things, I'm basically almost working on things on top of each other. Right. And I'll, I'll usually keep something up that is almost acts as an anchor. So in the past, it's been the stripy man or another thing. But there's normally, for the, for the duration of working on a body of work, if there's something I get that I, I, mm. I know is definitely going in the show, I'll often make everything next to that or make, have like two things sort of hung next to that so that mm -hmm. it's always in my mind that these are going to be together because otherwise it, it, it does cause real problems when it comes to hanging. And I think um, certainly for this body of work, this painting, sorry, the, the man that she's looking at, right. the, um, mm -hmm. the, the work on the, right. on, so this, sorry, this right, one, yeah. um, this was the one that I sort of kept up. Mm. And so because I also wanted to keep the shape quite uniform, this long, the format, mm -hmm. it being quite long, um, it helped to try and do things in relation to each other in that sense. And certainly with the, the, the woman with the binoculars, I mean, that belongs to another series. This is like the, the most recent iteration of, of the series. And it's very difficult to know what to hang next to her. Um, and by when I said about it needing to be something that could hold up to the gaze, there's the, the, the work that we hung next to it initially was staring straight back at her, which kind of looked a bit farcical. I mean, it looked a bit too mm -hmm. funny because he was really staring like you know, kind of like a standoff and it just looked a bit mad. So um, and, and then any some of the others who 
weren't really looking anywhere in particular, so that there's one of a dancer looking at her feet, um, that seemed wrong as well, because right. it turned the lady with the binoculars into a real it's a pervert. Yeah, yeah, it's she, a yeah, yeah. <laughs> she became a pervert. Right. Right. And so um, that didn't work either. Right. And so w when I landed on this guy here, it, it really was the sense that he, because he's, that he, he holds a certain kind of attitude and a certain presence and he's not looking at her. Mm -hmm. And his look is, incre he's just very, there's something very proud about the whole composition that I think held its own next to her, that it mm -hmm. didn't seem, he didn't seem to be cowering away from, right. from her, which was really important to the, to the general sort of layout. And I think it was, you know, we moved everything around several times, but because, as we're saying, everything was made in quite a small space, there's, there's, it's, it becomes easier to make these kind of conversations happen that, that certain works speak to other works, certain things are laid out together, there's the triptych that's, you know, sort of, I didn't, I couldn't decide on the layout right. until I brought it here. Yes, we were talking about, yeah. Yeah, so it, it was too big to see all together in the studio at once on one wall. Um, so I sort of said from the beginning, I need to get them there and, and then decide. But that was really interesting to me when you said that because I think you always knew it was a triptych. Yeah. But it's really interesting to realize that where the gazes were mm. focusing mm. wasn't always set, even though they were a triptych. Yeah. I couldn't even imagine. You know, yeah. I mean, what I love about this, mm. this painting, to these three paintings together, is the scale changes, mm. you know? It is very eccentric, <laughs> it seems yeah. to me, or to just... make a triptych <laughs> with paintings of such different scale. You but it totally yeah. works, you know, in terms of, mm. like, the gazes toward... Mm. Uh, we're, we're talking, it's almost like Egyptian, you know, mm. Sort of ancient Egyptian, where the the powerful figure is the biggest figure, you know, and then the attendants, you know, they they go down in size and importance, you know, to the smallest attendant, yeah. and then the cat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I love the kind of like the sense of that. I love the chairs too, mm -hmm. and this sort of notion of like seats of power, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the kind of fussy, overstuffed kind of. <laughs> You know, <laughs> the uh, and read as this sort of reference in some ways to kind of very classical portraiture mm -hmm. and kind of mm -hmm. the importance of a king. You know, mm -hmm. red was a costly color. Yeah, and so that still has resonance yeah. in, in in the you know the language of painting, yeah. but also. Um, yeah, I just was really struck by the size of the paintings. And yeah. you talked about wanting to, you know, when you're making the group of work for this show, having this sort of tall format, mm. you know, but each mm. format seems to have different issues for, mm. for you. So maybe you mm. could talk some about, you know, kind of changes in size and kind of mm. different approaches based on the mm. size. Yeah, no, you, paintings. You, you very politely called it um, eccentric, <laughs> but I, I think I think stupid no, that's great. <laughs> or mad. That's great. It could it that's so great. very nearly wasn't right, but the the thing was initially it was supposed to be. Um, I think the the the, 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 s the smallest one was supposed to be the same size as the other small one. It mm -hmm. was the, the next one up, so I changed my mind because. Um, I think I, I kind of just curious to see what happened, um, and and I think what what was really difficult about it though was that um, the red was actually really really so hard to hang in in mm. that space. We where it was initially meant to go, it just didn't. It, it overwhelmed the whole room because there was no other, there wasn't really another strong red anywhere in the room and, and it was, mm -hmm. it just looked completely wrong. And so it ended up that that was the only place we could put it, that it wouldn't interfere with your line of sight for anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, the positioning was really important for that. But then I think that when I was making it, I was really thinking about, again, how these gazes would work together and I knew I wanted at least one of them to be looking forward. I think it could only have been one of them looking forward. 
and it sort of made sense that it should be the biggest one um, because there was actually, it, it, I, I changed the face several times. He, he was, I, I couldn't work out what to do with his face. Mm. Um, he was looking down, he was looking to the side, he wasn't really addressing, he was kind of looking up and it, the only way it would work was looking forward. So that sort of dealt with that for, the, for that one. Mm -hmm. um, the chairs became really important in each case because um, with, in the two larger ones, the, the main problem I find always with, with red is that the only way to stop it becoming muddy is, is to use the white next to it. Um, and that is something I learned from Sargent, <laughs> uh -huh. um, the painting of Dr. Pozzi, the, the, the doctor, there's a sort of famous portrait of it. And the, the, really the three colors in that are the red, this kind of scarlet red next to a, a, a sort of crimson, sort of pinkish red, and then the white and the black, and mm. there's not really much else. Everything in it is more or less com composed of, uh, not a pure black, I, I never use a pure black, it's always a kind of combination of blue and brown, but it, it, it reads as a black, and it's really these three, almost becomes kind of flag-like, you move mm. them around, and they, they somehow qualify each other. Mm. And so in each one, this, this balance had to happen so that the, whether it's the collar and the cuffs or the chair, there needed to be this, a white mm. somewhere in it. And the, right. the, 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 the red of the chair in the central painting is, is actually exactly the same as the background. And so it's, it, it's really the, the color values was, was the only way to work it out was quite scientifically. Mm -hmm. um, but that yeah. influenced the positioning, because yeah. I was thinking of it like, of course the gazes had to be from the outside in, mm. but you were probably thinking more formally, like yeah. how do we balance these colors yeah. as a composition, yeah. you know, rather than I'm setting up this narrative through these gazes and that's the overarching way, you know, so that's yeah. why I was surprised when yeah. you said this wasn't the order of these paintings until I got here. Yeah, you know? yeah. So that makes, more, I, that makes yeah. a lot more sense to me. I couldn't make an absolute decision because I just didn't know how it would, right. how it would sit together. Mm -hmm. And so everyone kept, the, the galleries kept asking me, you know, we need to photograph this, you know, we need to know what <laughs> order what they go in. Is for. I was like, can't you just cut them and <laughs> stick right. them together afterwards? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> just, 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 you know, just right. send them out as individual. But right. it, it was really, uh, until you get, I, I always find that because the studio is so, such a, um, a, a, how can I put it? It really fools you. It's a real clown. I don't know, it's so, everything looks completely different. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and actually usually very, very much better. <laughs> so I always have to, over, I have to compensate for that in my own mind, you know, that, mm. that certain things are going to have to change. Right. So yeah, it's very, whilst I conceived of the whole show as a body of work and a series, um, I knew I couldn't really control the, the layout as much as I would have liked to mm -hmm. until I got here. Right. I'm going to skip ahead just because I got really interested in uh, Sickert, is that yep. how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. uh, a painter that I didn't know, but you referenced a lot when we were talking in the galleries yesterday. And um, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was looking at your work was um, I'd been in Madrid a couple of years ago, and there's a church uh, that Goya's done paintings in, and up in the dome, there are these figures who look down over a, a sort of balustrade at you, down at the bottom of the church. But when you look at the catalog that shows these figures in close-up, because they're very far away from you, it's really just three strokes and it's a face. But your eye puts it all together. And you, were, you, you said something in, in an interview about um, I forgot who the painter was you were referencing, but learning, it wasn't Goya, but learning from, it wasn't Manet, but <laughs> someone, learning from someone like that, that why do 10 marks when you can do three, you mm -hmm. know? And sort of getting to this economy in terms of the painting. Mm -hmm. And 
And Sickert is, um, I think, someone you reference a lot, too. And you can see, this is the cover of a book, but you can see how, how f you know, yeah. it's incredibly dense and fleshy, but mm -hmm. there are actually very few marks yeah. there. You yeah, know? yeah. No, it's, he was, he's always been such a huge um, inspiration mm. for me because I think that it was two things, really. I think first was a kind of ideological thing. It was about how one essentially paints one's own time mm. and encapsulates something of one's own time purely through the paint, though. Something about the way Sickert painted really you know, you can see the grime and the dirt and the the darkness and the, the difficulty and the, the squalor somehow of, of 19th century London. There's something really visceral, there's something so, it's, it's so hard to describe. I don't know, I think that's why people paint. <laughs> you just, you can't, it, it's so, mm -hmm. it's something very particular. In a similar way to Manet, there's just something in the making of it says it all, and I think, the other thing, the second thing, was, was this issue of um, economy and the fact that when you get up very close to a painting by Sick, it, it kind of collapses mm -hmm. into marks. It collapses into really what it is, which is, you know, that you see the, 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 the fabric of the, of the canvas, you see the, the where, how, how much work your eye is doing, how much the viewer is actually doing just in the looking and it's something I'm always trying to explain to my students <laughs> trying to get them to believe in in the mark itself and just allow the mark mm -hmm. to do 50 percent of the work because mm -hmm. as soon as you're thinking in outlines you 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 start to obsess over a picture rather than the painting because the the, the, the stuff of painting is what gives it the meaning it's the, the the marks that actually give painting the meaning so when when, when you start to, trying to get people not to think in terms of these outlines as the starting point, but the mark as the starting point. So the underpainting becoming important, the overpainting becoming mm -hmm. important. Every single piece of bare canvas that is somehow reading as light or, or a, a, a mark in itself, that all these things are, are what make the thing work. And with Sickert, this wonderful thing that happens with your eyes, that when you get further back, it seems to really tie together. The closer you get, the more it collapses. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, in, in a sense, it's, it's something to do with the being a real, really allowing, allowing the paint to be doing the work. And I, I, I don't think I'm necessarily there yet <laughs> in making that happen every time. I still, you know, sometimes it's really, you, you start to obsess over other things, but certainly it's something that I've become more and more conscious of over the years, and I'm, I, as as time goes on, and you train your eyes to become more um, sensitive to color. So, thinking, really looking at something, and, and trying to break it down into its its parts. So it, it actually, you know, the way that the the yellow in a brown. Hmm affects the the tone of the black next to it the mm -hmm. blue and the brown next to it just almost kind of scientifically what what the eye does with color and how all the relationships between the colors are what make the thing work or not work because mm -hmm. when I, I i think that's the other thing with actually the 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 speed at which i work that it it is so much about drawing those relationships and, and the economy of that um, and not allowing the other things to, to sort of break that somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a good painting to talk about in terms of those issues too because it's, uh, I hadn't seen patterning like this before mm -hmm. and, it's, and I realized that the patterning is so, mm -hmm. uh, joined in with the background, mm. you know? Mm. And we were talking about, you know, why use 10 strokes, <laughs> 10 marks when you mm. can use three? And you look closely at this painting and you mm. realize like, you know, that patch mm. of yellow on his shoulder, mm. just, those mm. stripes are just there and the background mm. is the background, mm. but it has the volume of a sweater piece of fabric yeah. on the shoulder. Yeah. Um, 
And you, you started to talk about time, and you know, much has been made of the fact that you make paintings kind of in a day, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but there was a quote that I thought was very beautiful uh, from an interview where you said um, about sort of painting, I don't want to go back and fix problems in paintings because a painting is built up of a stream of thoughts, and it's very hard to click back in place what I was previously thinking. I frequently miss the point in my own work if I don't move on to the next painting. That energy or movement that you're talking about can easily get lost if I don't continue to move forward. And I was thinking about that quote in terms of you know, your working method and also thinking about it in relationship to improvisation and jazz. And um, the saxophonist that played with uh, Thelonious Monk, Charlie Rouse, said in a movie, um, that when Thelonious Monk was making albums, he would only take the first take or the second take, you know, hardly ever the third, because the first and second take was where the feeling was. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the importance was not the perfection of the recording, but the feeling you're getting. And then Charlie Rouse you know, is asked, well, what if you mess up? And he said, if you mess up, that's it. <laughs> you, know? you have to hear that for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so yeah. that's really interesting to me because you, th there are moments in the paintings where you know, there's kind of an awkwardness. Mm -hmm. And I love like, oh, the hand is a little too big. Mm -hmm. But you don't correct that because it's about the feeling. Mm -hmm. And you don't correct it because it means to go into it again and yeah. getting into a head that's already passed. Yeah. And it's more interesting and important to go on to the next painting. You yeah. know? And I think that keeps the paintings incredibly fresh, but, mm -hmm. but I just love this idea of you know, improvisation and yeah. like, you know, yeah. improvisation is about not missing a chance. You yeah. can't go back and correct it. You yeah. know? Either you did it then or you didn't do it. Yeah, you know? no, entirely. And I think it, it, it um, makes me think of the, just this idea of feeling and, and of, of how you, you can't always describe something, so you can't always make it right <laughs> so you can't always correct it right and it, it also you know I, I listen to a lot of jazz I listen to all kinds of things when I'm working mostly radio for dramas which is probably not the best thing to listen to <laughs> when you're working but yeah. the um the when it's music it tends to be jazz and I I really love this um quote from a a, a drummer who worked with Miles Davis who said that he um he, it was his first day on the job. He was mm. this little English guy from, you know, somewhere in the north of England. And he, he was jamming, you know, playing with Miles Davis for the first time. And he was terrified. And he goes in and he's like, you know, he's just improvising. And, and he plays along as best he can. And Miles Davis goes up to him and says, he just says nothing at all, but boom, boom. And he was expected to just know what to do. Right. And, so, <laughs> and it was all he said, he was terrified. And then he, he started to play along. And then suddenly it started to make sense because he was listening to everyone else. And he realized that the tempo, the, the sound, the feeling he was meant to get was this kind of rhythm of boom, boom, ba, ba. But that was all my, he didn't right. say, oh, you need to do it more right. like this. Because I think it, it was, Again, it was just bringing it back to what it actually is, that, mm -hmm. that feeling of what it should be. And I always, I always th uh, when I try and describe it, particularly to my students or, or when I'm trying to literally help someone progress with a particular kind of painting, it's the only way I find to do that is by literally talking about these color relationships or the, the idea of the light where the light's falling, what the light's doing, what the dark is doing. And these are just really, they become really kind of technical, formal explanations because what I really, you know, want to say is just so unhelpful. <laughs> it's, and it is tantamount to the boom, boom, bap, bap thing. Right. Um, but it, I suppose it's how, yeah, how you allow a sensibility to, to take hold and how you... Um, yeah, ne negotiate something that you can't put into words. Well, it's about how you make your paintings yours as opposed yeah. to all your influences. Yeah. And, and that can't, someone has to just figure that out. Yeah. And you can't really, Yeah. being told it doesn't work. It doesn't, it really doesn't. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I think it was important for me to have another 
outlet or something. I mean, I, I write as well, but it's, it's, a, it's a very different approach to narrative. Mm. Um, it's fiction or it's poetry or it's a number of different things, but it, it, it tends to use those things very differently to the, to the paintings because I think there are, there are things that I can say better in a painting and things I can say better in, in prose. I was going to ask you about the writing because for me writing is as hard as making artwork and I'd rather just make the artwork. So, uh, <laughs> but you don't write for paintings. The, no. the writing is totally... Mm, completely separate. It feels related, but it's not yeah. specific to... Yeah. yeah, there's definitely a feeling of... There's a similar logic, um, mm -hmm. just a different, a very different approach. And, and it, it's... I have less control over it. I think I'm less... I suppose I'm less confident about it. So um, what started the other week as a, a poem has become a detective story, and I've never written a detective story. But I'm really enjoying it. I think it's, oh, it must nice. be really bad, because I'm really, really enjoying it. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, um, yeah, it's all about a policeman. Um, yeah, but I, <laughs> it's a story about a policeman. I don't know anything about the police. But I feel like maybe I should go and get arrested just to find out what it, you know, what, what, what goes on. I'm trying to, that's the thing, it's because I don't know about it. That makes it even more fun. Um, but I, I'm trying to sort of, yeah, write this narrative about a, a policeman going about his, his job. Um, Do you yeah. always write fiction? Um, yeah, you should, yeah, oh. yeah, for the most part. And, but as, and uh, I guess sort of, uh, hard to call them poems, really, but mm -hmm. other kinds of prose as well. So, yeah, mm. yeah. I wanted to. Uh, I'm going to admit something sort of embarrassing, um, <laughs> but um, I just came to Munich yesterday, so I hadn't seen the show, but I'd been sent images, mm -hmm. and this is one of the images I was sent, mm -hmm. and I was. And this was one of the images. Mm -hmm. And when we were walking around the show, I said, well, the woman in this painting, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, that's a man. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, yes. But it was funny because my excuse was, well, I'd only seen images. Mm -hmm. And they're a little, they were small and hard to read. But then I'm standing in front of the painting. And what was interesting to me is, you know, I'll, I'll I'll read this quote, and you say, uh, in an interview, you said, race is something I can completely manipulate or reinvent or use as I want. The complexity of this is an essential part of my work. And I was wondering, is that something you feel you can do with gender? Yeah. And, and part of it was my misreading of these paintings brought yeah. that kind of up as a question, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, for me, they always exist so much as as, as paintings, as, as kind of people, but almost more beyond that. There's something mm. almost superhuman about them, which means that, there's, that they often have characteristics of both. I mean, for, for this one, I really read him as a, as a man because there's something very, um, I don't know, maybe I find him attractive. I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> but there's, there's something very, um, yeah, it, it shifts. I mean, there, there, there are always um, kind of characteristics of both in all. Um, so often the ones that, that I regard as, as women, I always have this thing, if, if I think someone is, a little bit too, cons like a woman in the painting is too conspicuously, um, how should I put it, um, pretty in a sort of pop, almost kind of pop cultural sort of way mm. or in a popular kind of way. Mm -hmm. I, she sort of turns away or she mm. looks down or she's, she's never really, it's very rare that they're looking forward. You know, there's always a, a slight kind of denial mm -hmm. that I, you know, that it's, it's complicated, but, I, so maybe yeah. I invest a lot of those kind of very recognizably pretty features into men uh, so instead. The pretty man. <laughs> can, uh, yeah. yeah, like the, and and then and because yeah. the men are, to me the men are never one hundred percent pretty or right. feminine. Right. They're always kind of um, there's there's a touch of something. Right. You know they're 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 touched. They're 
um, enchanted somehow. There's mm-hmm. there's a there's a a magic to them. There's a there's a mischief. It's it's yeah. Well, I have huge crushes on half the paintings that are shown. <laughs> so. There you go. So do I. <laughs> Touch I, me. No. <laughs> I know. I think I was. I used to think I was just. I was just painting the ideal husband, or so, the man I haven't found yet, <laughs> or something. He's just everywhere. He's every. No, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? That's not what I'm doing at all. At all. It's not just painting men because I can't get one. It's, <laughs> no, it's 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 um yeah it, it it's something I um yeah I, I find I I I, lo- I love to revel in it somehow. I really enjoy that about them. The using, uh, bringing beauty in in this way, I think, mm. yeah. Can we talk about something very obvious, but mm-hmm. I haven't seen it asked mm-hmm. anywhere? There are paintings of men, there are painting of men in groups, mm-hmm. there are painting of women, there are painting of women in groups. Mm-hmm. Are there painting of men and women together? No. Why? I just haven't got it right. <laughs> and, and you know, the, the, <laughs> the problem, I, yeah. or maybe there was one, but I didn't put it out, it didn't work. Huh. There's something about, I don't know, there's something about putting men and women together. (laughs) Maybe this is why I'm single. No, something about putting men and women together that for me never quite, it always looks wrong. I don't know that there's, (laughs) looking at you all, it's all wrong. No, um, there's, there's just, they're kind of, I don't know, either they look like they're, or maybe, no, there's one, there's one of a, a man kissing a woman's hand, but they're mm. both so kind of odious that it, it, it becomes something else. They're right. kind of horrible. So you don't, they're kind of both, she's going, Ooh, and he's going, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's not really, I don't know, I, haven't, I think I just haven't got it right yet. Mm-hmm. There have been large, there was one, one of the, there was a painting of a group of diplomats, I think, mm. where there's one woman mm-hmm. in it. Um, I think that's the only time mm. They've really kind of mingled. But it was, I, it's partly that I've just never got it right. And I think the reason why I've never got it right is that it tends to slip into the, either the wrong kind of romance mm. or um, like a really, like a, something kind of slightly sentimental or twee or something. Um, or, yeah, or just, or warring somehow. It's, it's one or the other. So. The narrative is predetermined yeah, too much and too it's too much. hard to yeah, escape. I mean, Definitely. I think one of the, I, I meant to bring an image of it to give to you, but there was an, an image of a painting that for me is one of the most romantic things I've ever done. And it's mm. two men in the wilderness in, in their pants, pulling their socks on. And that, that for me is just, it just says it all about <laughs> the, what we all want, yeah. right? You know, yeah. the kind of love we're yeah. all looking for. But um, I, yeah, if it was a man and a woman, it mm-hmm. would just look, Dirty, I don't know. But it's interesting. <laughs> right. Well, this is interesting because these two paintings, this this one and this one, are next yeah. to each other. Yeah. So there is this conversation, yeah. even though they're looking. Yeah. yeah. They're not looking at each other. That's they're, actually how I've got round it. That's mm-hmm. how I've got round it. Is if right. you put them on different canvases and just hang them next to each other, mm-hmm. then it's fine. Right. Because there's a there's a diptych as well. That's reminded me. Mm-hmm. There's another diptych. Um, that was in the show in New York a couple of years ago where it's a, a woman, I guess similar to this actually, it's a woman lying down and a man lying down mm-hmm. and they're sort of facing each other but at a different angle so they're not quite looking at each other. Mm-hmm. And that's the way that I bring men and women together right. separately. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, it's sort of a funny question because I'm, you know, I live in New York and I've seen, I think maybe the first time I saw your work was in New York, and I was wondering, is there a different way that people process your work in the United States than they process your work in Europe? And yeah. I asked that because I once was, um, when the uh, artist Steve McQueen um, had done 12 Years a Slave, he was in New York and did a press conference um, with some of the actors in the movie. And it was a press conference sponsored by a group of black journalists. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions to Steve was, um, you know, Steve, I see from your films that, you know, there's a very sympathetic and beautiful portrayal 
of black women, so you must you know, really love black women. And in you know, typical Steve McQueen kind of response, it's like, yeah, yeah, yes, I love, I love black women. I'm, I'm married to a white one, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I love black women, you know? And it was this kind of ridiculous question, you know, in a way that was trying to position him as a yeah. certain, you yeah. know, and he just wasn't having it. Yeah. But I was wondering, have you had that kind of you know, the way the work is processed in yeah. the United States and the kinds of conversations we're having now in the United States yeah. change, you know, yeah. are different than the kinds of conversations you have here. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, think, I think they probably are quite different. I think mm. there's certain things that are more um, uh, acceptable in the US somehow that, you know, that... Um, I don't know if that's to do with the artist community there mm. being, you know, there is a large black artist community there, so it's, it's a different kind of reception in the first place. Um, and whereas I guess in, I suppose thinking more about um, the, the UK, because that's where I am, it's, it's, um, it, it's almost like they, they won't mention it until you do because they're all terribly polite. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, if I, if I don't... What's it? What's it? Oh, oh, I mean race. Oh, okay. The, the, the R word. Right. Um, so they... Because um, I, I don't necessarily... Um, I, I suppose I... I'm, I'm always happy to talk about everything somehow, but, I mean, it, it, it's never... It's not necessarily the first thing I'll talk about in relation mm -hmm. to the work, simply because it's not necessarily the first thing I think about. Right. And it seemed to be quite a... Um, when people finally did ask me in more in sort of... Because nobody really... I suppose nobody ever really asked me why they were all black or anything like that in the US. Or I, I have been asked that in, in Europe. Hmm. Um, not in a horrible way. Um, but just in a kind of curious way. And my, my answer, which seemed to clear it up immediately, was, well, wouldn't it be really strange if they were all white? Um, or and if they were if they were different colours, that would just be, I don't know. It would. It's a different work. It's a right. very different. Then it's a Benetton ad. I don't. Mm. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Benetton ads. But you know, I <laughs> I I didn't really. It wasn't about sort of showing a. I, I, there was nothing I was trying to show about the the joy of a of a rainbow nation about them. It mm -hmm. was really. I don't know. I mean, I I always said, well, I, I I grew up around black people. It was nothing to me. There was nothing. Odd. I think that was the main thing. There was nothing odd about black figures in in the paintings, or, or mm -hmm. the fact that the figures are black. It it didn't seem odd, and and it didn't seem. I didn't. After a while, I actually didn't really notice because I've I've in in a sense when you've never really necessarily seen anything else when you've woken up and looking looked in the mirror or looked around at your family. It takes away the oddness. The it to me, it's not exotic. Right. So uh, it, it's it it didn't it, it never really came up in my own mind mm -hmm. in the same way. So I mean, I'm not completely naive. I know why people were surprised, but it it it, it didn't seem. I don't know. It it seemed more of a challenge to to people who asked me that to say, well, why why how is that odd? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's. Because, I mean, what was also quite interesting was the reception of the work in, in Cape Town. And I, I did a show in, at Stevenson in Cape Town. And again, it was a, quite a different response. Hmm. Certain things, again, the question never really came up right. in the same way. Um, yeah. I guess I asked because, you know, an artist like Kerry James Marshall has talked about, you know, his paintings, which have black figures mm -hmm. in them, but that is, in some sense, a kind of corrective for him, mm -hmm. you know, going into museums when he was mm -hmm. starting as an artist and not seeing black faces mm -hmm. in museums. And mm -hmm. so there's a kind of political imperative yeah. to, to the subject yeah. there, which yeah. I don't feel like you're invested in that kind of, you know, mm. they have to be black in this kind of, mm. because, you know, I need to walk in the museum and see a black face. Yeah, you know. you know, it's funny, I, I, I think on some level, maybe that is there, but I think it was, when I think about when I was going to museums, I, I was probably more 
I, you know, I, it's funny, I never really noticed that everyone was white. Yeah, that, <laughs> maybe I just don't see these, maybe I'm colorblind. No, I think the thing was that I, I was maybe more obsessed with the paintings themselves. Mm -hmm. And when I came to start painting the figure, I just felt that it was very natural that they should be black. And I, I think that that is a political stance. You know, that is, there is something in there that is, you know, I have, I'm, I'm kind of clear on the fact that that's important to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was less about what I necessarily wanted to see in the museum, more what I thought was natural. Right. As natural as putting the blue next to the yellow in the skin to make it, you know, the orange in the skin to make it jump out. There was something about thinking about skin, thinking about color, thinking about race, thinking about gender, thinking about painting, all those things that I got really excited about and I wanted to do. Um, and I, yeah, because I'm very, um, I think you can only ever really talk from your own experience. I think that's the thing. Um, I was very wary of what my, you know, my early, if I think back to when I was first starting as a, starting on my foundation course at, um, in, in art school in, in London, um, there were various people who I, I think I probably wanted to emulate. So mm -hmm. I, I, I tried to make my own Chris Ophelis. Right. I probably yeah. tried a few Glenn Ligons. You know, I, I think you... That's you, easy. You, Stencils. <laughs> But you, <laughs> then, then you have this realization that yeah. you know you can't really. Mm -hmm. I, I can't speak for anyone else. You know, I, I couldn't really do that. So, um, it, I realized there was no, there wasn't necessarily a trope that mm. was black painting or black art or that, you know there was nothing I could really, as much as I could admire, I, I could only think about my own experience, and mm -hmm. that was going to. Um, places like the National Gallery and, and wandering around on my own from when I was, I don't know, sort of 16 or something, mm -hmm. and, and trying to understand what these, why these paintings worked and what mm -hmm. worked in them and what I wanted to do in relation to painting and how, how I wanted to be, you know, how I wanted to become in the work, what I, what I wanted to try and make the paint do. So yeah. I think in terms of starting points, if I had one, it was, it was that. Right. Yeah.